and I will be your moderator for this event, a one hour virtual book discussion of Tassin Sham's monograph, Here, There and Elsewhere, The Making of Immigrant Identities in a Globalized World. This book published by Stanford University Press is in the series I co-edit with Hung Kam Tai on globalization in everyday life. Joining us is the author, Tassin Sham, an assistant professor of sociology at University of Toronto, and three esteemed panelists who, who each will comment on her book. Our panelists have each produced some of the most path-breaking works in recent years in immigration studies, so we are very fortunate to have them participate in, in this discussion. First, uh, and we will go um, by alphabetical order. First, we have David Fitzgerald, Gildred Chair in US-Mexican Relations and Professor of Sociology at University of California, San Diego. Also joining us is Peggy Levitz, Professor of Sociology at Wellesley College. And last but not least, we have Robert Smith, Professor of Sociology, Immigration Studies and Public Affairs at Baruch College and the Graduate Center in New York City. Our discussion, We'll begin with Tassin briefly introducing her book for about seven minutes. Then she will soon be followed with comments from each of our panelists. They will speak for around 12 minutes each, after which we will open it up to questions from the audience. So let me now invite Tassin to give her introductory remarks. Thank you, Yosel. Um, thank you everyone for Zooming in. Thank you, Stanford Press, for hosting this book launch. And of course, thank you, David, Peggy, and Rob for discussing my book and Russell for moderating the discussion. My book, Here, There, and Elsewhere, is about how, contrary to common perception, immigrants' identities are shaped by global politics, not just in the immigrants sending and receiving countries, but also in those places located beyond the homeland and hostland places I conceptualize as elsewhere, uh, based on ethnographic data, in-depth interviews, and analysis of social media activities of South Asian Muslim Americans, I present a new analytical model for studying immigrant identity formation, the multi-centered relational framework, which encompasses global geopolitics in the immigrants' homeland, hostland, and elsewhere. The book is actually rooted in my personal story as much as it is embedded in my curiosity as a migration scholar. I am a first generation Bangladeshi immigrant who first arrived in her, uh, who first arrived with her family in the United States as a teenager. My first introduction to the US was in Mississippi, specifically Hattiesburg, a small predominantly white conservative college town where my parents still live. I was recuperating from a particularly grueling quarter of graduate school at UCLA uh, at my parents when the 2015 Charlie Hebdo attacks took place. It was a horrific event, but I also remember my parents being glued to their TV following the live coverage. Even though the attacks had happened in France and elsewhere that is neither Bangladesh, which my parents call home, nor the United States, which they not, uh, where they now live, they still feared a backlash in their small town. They called the handful of other Bangladeshi Muslims they knew in the area and learned that they too were fearing a backlash. One of their friends, a hijabi woman who was studying to become a doctor, for instance, had decided not to go to the local library the next day to study. Later that year, when ISIS attacked the Bataclan, I was back in Los Angeles. But there too, I saw the same kinds of fears among the South Asian communities I was studying, despite the significantly more cosmopolitan milieu. The common frame of reference that hung over every one of these communities was 9-11, as if the ISIS attacks had not happened far away in France, but here in America. Uh, of course, immigrants have various global connections that transcend homeland and hostland borders. But how do these places beyond, but in relation to the homeland and hostland, also shape immigrants' identities? I could not find an answer to this question in the foundational readings on international migration, which largely focused on the sending and receiving countries. Um, so assimilation scholarship looks at how hostland contexts shape immigrants' homeland identities over time, 
Transnationalism expands the focus beyond the hostland, but is still largely tied within the dyadic homeland hostland paradigm. And diaspora looks at how members of a dispersed population are linked to a common homeland and to each other, but largely overlooks the hostland contexts. My book extends the scholarship of international migration by showing how cases beyond the homeland and hostland elsewhere shapes how immigrants identify themselves, that is, immigrants' self-identification with elsewhere, and how those places shape how others in the hostland view these immigrants, that is, identification of immigrants by others in relation to elsewhere. Using data on South Asian Muslim Americans, I show that different dimensions of the immigrants of these immigrants' Muslim identity category connect them to different elsewhere contexts. As Muslims, these immigrants are members of the Ummah, the imagined worldwide community of Muslims that transcends borders and connects all Muslims by producing shared beliefs, practices, and a sense of membership. But the heartland of this imagined community is not found in South Asia, but in the Middle East. As the birthplace of Prophet Muhammad and the location of Islam's holiest sites, the Middle East is arguably the religious and political center of the Muslim world. And as self-identifying Muslims, these immigrants subscribe to the various places, peoples, histories, and conflicts in the Middle East that sustained their Muslim identities. As such, many of my participants, for instance, were politically oriented towards various elsewhere Middle Eastern places, such as Palestine, Syria, and Turkey. But how they self-identified did not determine how others perceived them in the hostland. Despite the salience of the Middle East in their self-identification, it was the Muslim-related contexts in Europe that determined how they were perceived in America. For example, whereas the 2015 ISIS Paris attacks produced Islamophobic backlash in the US, similar attacks in Beirut by ISIS just one day before the Paris attacks had gone virtually unnoticed. So, the multi-centered relational framework captures three specific points of focus or centers, thereby expanding the homeland hostland dyad in these examples. First, we have the homeland, in this case, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. Second, we have the hostland, the United States. And third, we have the elsewhere, in these examples, the Middle East and Europe. The goal of the multi-centered relational framework is to capture if, how, and when the relationship between which centers become salient and shape the immigrants' worldviews and day-to-day -day interactions. But elsewhere is not everywhere. A place located beyond the homeland and hostland by itself is not important to the immigrants' identities. It is only when those places are relevant to contexts in the homeland society, the hostland society, and the relationship between the two that the place becomes an elsewhere. I argue in, so elsewhere is a place that is meaningful for not just the immigrants themselves, but also to those around them, which is why elsewhere shapes how immigrants locate themselves in both global and hostland social hierarchies. Uh, I argue that and a place is an elsewhere, the answer is yes to the following questions. Do contexts in a place beyond the homeland and hostland shape the immigrants' own sense of selves? Do those contexts shape how others in the hostland view these immigrants in day-to-day -day life? My book presents my findings to these questions and lays down the conditions, the limitations, the parameters and generalizability of this elsewhere framework. Since I finished writing this book in late 2019, I think now there is more evidence why we as migration scholars should locate immigrants' experiences in connection to contexts not just here and there, but also elsewhere. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that what happens in a faraway foreign land does not stop at its borders, but can produce domino effects, be they social, political, epidemiological, that are forced Forceful enough, uh, forceful enough to lock down the entire world. And I think we can see more clearly than perhaps any other time in recent memory, the power of globalization and how that intersects with local forms of boundary work like race, ethnicity, nationalism, religion. I would be happy to talk about this more, but now I look to the discussants for their comments. So, uh, David? <laughs> 
Yes, well, thanks very much. There is so much to, to say about this book and the reasons that I like it, but let me just highlight uh, three things that, that I find especially engaging. The first is just how generative um, it is. It makes one think about the concept of elsewheres in other times in history, in other country cases, in the cases of other immigrant groups. It's very hard to see something if you're not looking for it. And after reading this book, it makes me look at those cases and, and search for evidence of the kinds of dynamics that uh, the Professor Shams has, has identified and to see if we can push those arguments even further. The second thing I really like about it is just how um, interactive it is at multiple levels. And, and already you've heard in the synopsis some of those interactions, but there's an interaction between immigrants and the host, between homelands and uh, host lands, most creatively among the, the homeland, hostland, elsewhere, triad. And it's by looking at those kinds of interactions rather than simply focusing on one of the elements that the book has such a dynamism uh, to it. And then finally, it has this interpretive richness. Uh, the, the author has a real eye for telling these key ethnographic details and then interpreting them for the reader in a way that very impressively draws on a deep cultural, linguistic, and political knowledge of many different contexts in uh, different parts of North America, different parts of South Asia, and, and beyond. So it's, it's such an impressive book that I actually found myself wondering, how come someone hasn't written this book before? Um, the, the basic um, insightful point about the importance of elsewheres in the immigrant experience, um, after reading the book seems almost obvious. And yet I strain to find that point made in the existing uh, theoretical literature. Finding other empirical examples is easy enough, but I, I don't know of anyone else who has systematically and in such an analytical way elaborated this point. And I, I seriously wonder why someone hasn't made this, this really important point before. I'd be very interested in what anyone in this, uh, this event has uh, to say about that. My substantive questions have to do with um, a set of questions about the idea of exogenous shock, which is a, a key in, in the text, obviously drawing from, from economics. Uh, the argument in the book is that exogenous shocks are how an anywhere, which has no special significance to immigrants, uh, becomes an elsewhere that does have this special significance. Um, an exogenous shock is defined as an unexpected event that has originated from outside of the boundaries of the state, um, but still has impacted the society within a state by disrupting the international order. And I would like to, to push further and to clarify both the exogeneity and the shock, as well as the conditions under which this mechanism uh, matters for the, the book's basic argument. So let's talk first about um, exogeny. The, the parts of the text that focus on the different homelands in South Asia, primarily talking about uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and, and India, point out the many connections, both historical and contemporary, between South Asia and the Middle East as the primary of the elsewheres that are discussed in the book. So there's a lot of discussion, for example, about the common uh, experience of having been controlled by the British, the reaction against that, and, and more contemporary uh, linkages. And I think that there's something of a tension between that story of connections within a system and the idea of exogeny, which by definition is uh, about forces coming from outside a system. So for example, there's uh, the claim that the 9-11 attacks were an exogenous shock in, in Pakistan. And I think that story could be retold as one of endogeny and of feedback loops in a system involving interstate alliances of Pakistani, US, and Saudi support for uh, the Mujahideen, for example. And without getting into all the empirical weeds of, of that episode, the, the basic theoretical question is, is it really necessary to have this notion of exogeny to explain the importance of elsewheres in the lives of so many immigrants. And I think maybe, maybe it's not, maybe the point could be um, broader than that. 
The second issue I'd like to raise has to do with shocks. The, the text very convincingly sh does show how particular events, such as the, the Paris ISIS attacks um, that were just mentioned, um, have had an impact in the lives of many South Asian immigrants in the US. The, the different methods used in the text, the ethnographic observations, the interviews, the content analysis of different online material, very persuasively show the importance of those events. But I wonder if it's possible to go beyond that. I, I wonder if the focus on these particular events in some ways obscures longer term processes unfolding over um, greater, greater time periods that also may be having these kinds of elsewhere effects on the lives of, of immigrants living in a place like the US. I'm thinking here, for example, of a long-term pro process of decolonization during the Cold War that doesn't just involve the, the homelands, but also a much larger set of, of elsewheres. And the way that that kind of decolonization in that particular geopolitical context reframed the legitimacy of racist immigration policies, for example, and had really strong effects, not just on immigration policy, but also on the integration of non-Europeans living in uh, Anglophone settler societies, for example. So I think that the argument could actually be taken uh, further, that, that that uh, Professor Shams has identified a really important part, point here about elsewheres, um, but the focus on um, events shouldn't blind us to the, the importance of these less dramatic and, and longer term processes uh, as well. And then finally, I would invite some, some further reflection on conditionality. Uh, the, the book argues that there are two conditions um, under which an exogenous shock turns an anywhere into an elsewhere. One of the conditions is uh, self-identification, that um, immigrants identify with um, a membership category that in some ways is uh, connected to an elsewhere. And the second condition is that there is a process of uh, ascription by the host, that um, the categories derived from that elsewhere are deployed by people in the host society, often in ways that uh, racially or religiously lump together immigrants with the larger category, or that simply make categorization errors. And there are some famous examples that are mentioned in the book of, of these kinds of, of errors. So for example, there's, uh, th there's mention of the murder of uh, Chinese American Vincent Chen, um, who was miscategorized as Japanese and murdered by a group of white assailants in Detroit in 1982, or the, the Sikh man Balbir Singh Saadi, who was killed by a white assailant uh, following 9-11 in Arizona after being miscategorized as Muslim. Uh, very interestingly, for the, our current uh, COVID pandemic era, there is uh, the mention of some earlier epidemics around uh, Zika and Ebola, in which people from South America and, and people from Africa were all lumped together uh, in the host society and considered to be a threat, regardless of the particular exposure that they might have had um, or how they saw themselves. And so the theoretical question here is that it seems to me that in all four of these cases that the self-identification of the immigrants um, didn't really matter nearly as much as the, the ascription um, on the part of people in, in the host society um, for the salience of the elsewhere to be activated. So is widespread immigrant self-identification with an elsewhere category, um, is that sufficient but unnecessary to activate that category? And we can ask the same question about um, ascription by the host society. Is that, uh, is that sufficient but unnecessary to activate uh, the elsewhere? Um, do we really need both or would, would one of them suffice? Um, it, you know, it may well be that it's too hard to, to make a blanket statement given the underlying very messy reality. Um, but what I am sure is that uh, not just today, but for a long time to come, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, this book, engaging its lesson, lessons, pushing it further, 
And it's a real privilege to, to be here as part of the conversation at the launch. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, David. Um, so now, uh, Peggy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this book panel and, and this celebration. Um, it's good to be with old friends and with new friends, whether I can actually see them or, or just feel them in the, in the, in the internet. Um, it's been a delight to read and think about this book. And I, um, it was very generative uh, for me um, in terms of uh, thinking about questions that I wanted to talk about with you. So um, that will be the focus of most of my comments. But um, your book is a very welcome addition to the migration literature for many reasons. Um, but I want to highlight three in particular. The first is because of the way it expands our understanding of the important nodes of the transnational fields in which many migrants are embedded. Um, while I disagree somewhat with your, um, uh, your synopsis of, of whether transnational um, scholarship has gone beyond the um, bilateral focus, um, I, what I really like here is how you call attention to the many ways that the personal and geopolitical elsewheres figure into identity formation and the kinds of affiliations and identities that ensue. And what's more, it's not just that migrants care about or are affected by other places beyond their home and hostland where their co-nationals and co-religionists live, but that the exogenous geopolitical shocks that drive this forward occur at multiple scales, including the national, the regional, and the global, which also inform these very personal journeys. Secondly, and relatedly, um, Tassin shows us that because assimilation is a two-way street, these exogenous shocks affect how much people are allowed to assimilate and in what ways, as well as how much they want to. Again, both processes are shaped by factors operating at multiple scales that can be very close or far away. And finally, I really appreciate your focus on religion. Despite the fact that many of the people we study are deeply religious, our field still suffers from a blind spot about how religious identities that are sometimes inseparable from ethnicity and nationality and sometimes quite distinct also form the basis for deterritorialized attachments. In the case of the folks you described, religion as the primary axis of identity formation is sometimes chosen and sometimes imposed by the broader context. Those exogenous shocks that are happening around the world sometimes force newcomers into religious identificational corners. I really like your discussion about how geopolitical factors affect what it means to be a good Muslim in the US and about what your respondents think about how what happens to Muslims in Africa or Europe affect who can become a good Muslim here and what that actually looks like. That, that is often about showing that Muslims are good here, although other people who share their faith are labeled by others as not. But I wonder about the struggle over where goodness is defined and where the materials come from with which to enact it. I also want to know more about what differences, what difference it makes when the geopolitical shocks that drive forward these judgments and their ensuing marginalization are national, global, or regional. Let's take the example of authenticity or sacralization. Let me give you an example from the art world. Be, um, before the recent disaster in Beirut, artists and art managers, whether they were museum curators or gallery owners, were hard at work trying to create an internationally recognized art scene in Lebanon. And there are two broad groups. One stresses Lebanon's Christian multi-denominational Levantine past that links it to the Mediterranean, Christianity, and ultimately to Europe. These folks still want to get to Paris or New York, which are the traditional centers of power in the global art world. The other wants to create an alternative post-colonial scene, which would recenter the art world into the global south through events like the Dakar Biennial and the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in Cape Town. Neither group wants to be part of developments in the Gulf, which although museums are rising everywhere in that region, they consider to be a cultural desert that's inventing artistic production from scratch. 
So that makes me think of how good Muslims dealing with the rise of conservative Islam that's being promoted in Saudi Arabia or the plethora of teaching materials for religious education or the training of imams that come out of that region. How do they, how do they deal with that? So these, as you know, tend to espouse a particular version of Islam with its roots in Arabia that leave other Muslims from South or Southeast or Southeast Asia out. And you mentioned that on the ground, Saudi Arabia's authority over the Muslim world translated into a hierarchy of religiosity that ranks believers based on their nationality. So Arab immigrants are supposed, or Arab, Arab believers are supposedly more knowledgeable than South Asian Muslims and they speak the mother tongue. So the tools of authentication are increasingly um, created elsewhere. And I, I wanna hear more about how your respondents think about this and what you think the implications are for the next generation um, who and how they might think about how they're located here, there, and elsewhere. A here, there, and elsewhere relational framework is also a way of saying that there are many ways of embracing deterritorialist identities. You come close to this when you talk about what you call Muslim pan-ethnicity. In a Muslim majority country like Pakistan or Bangladesh, religion and ethnicity or nationality are inextricably linked, but for each individual, I think one leads the way for the other. One person may locate themselves in a transnational space where their co-nationals are. So if we're talking about Bangladeshis, that might be Boston, London, the Gulf, and Australia, among other places about other people um, locate themselves in a religious landscape, such as the Kingdom of Christ or the Ummah, as you mentioned. And the symbols and boundaries of these landscapes are not flags or political capitals or national holidays. They're holy places and pilgrimage sites and places where religious leaders work from. The people who see themselves as living in this space identify as religious global citizens. And I use this term purposefully because their identities mimic the logic of, of political citizenship. They feel like they're fulfilling their responsibilities by paying taxes or tithing and obeying the leaders and the laws, and they get certain rights and responsibility. They get certain rights in the form of social services or protections, like or finding a job or a home in return. In some cases, these are religi exclusive religious global citizens who care only about their own. In other cases, people enter a religious door to, to care all about all of humanity. And I'd like to hear more about how you think this framework maps onto or contradicts your findings. Do you wanna call some of your respondents religious global global citizens in your Rohingya cause, is it mostly because they see their marginalization in the US reflected back in these other experiences, or was it because they were part of the same religious nation and they felt some sense of affinity with and responsibility for their fellow citizens? You seem surprised that some of your respondents care more about Muslims elsewhere than in the homeland, but I think this makes perfect sense when one locates oneself in a religious transnational space not one defined by national political boundaries. And finally, a key to how frequently religious global citizenship, citizenship takes shape in the US also, which you also touch on your analysis, but I want to, I would love it if you could expand on, is how Islam is becoming institutionalized in the United States. Like to what extent it's being forced into a congregational form or some kind of national political organization that is not um, uh, an import from the homeland. Um, and the extent to which these, um, these, these institutional arrangements that are emerging uh, connect to Muslim religious transnational movements around the world. So are movements like the Gulen movement or Tbiligi Jamaat a factor in your story? And are these new tradition, transnational institutional arrangements in addition to the national ar arrangements that you describe, um, what do you think their, what's your prediction about their, um, their role in uh, what the South Asian Muslim community is gonna look like in the future? So I just wanna end by saying I really in enjoyed this book. It was great to think with, and I'm uh, looking forward to where you go next with these ideas. Thanks very much.
So thank you, uh, Peggy. So now uh, we have uh, Rob. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Can you hear me properly? Yes. Yes. Good. So, um, so I really enjoyed reading your book, uh, Tassin. I, it was it was actually quite a bit of fun, um, and um, the bad thing about going that when you have insightful colleagues that go in front of you, they take away some of the things you're going to say. So I will try to um, not be too repetitive to the things that they said, but I will, um, I think it bears repetition um, to say that I really liked the framework that you created and I find it sort of pushing me. It's like a retrospective excavation of other cases, right? A reframing of the understanding of other cases that you already had an understanding of. And I think it's a very useful way to do that. The framework, the relational framework you've laid out. And I really also liked about the relational framework. It forces you to be open to your data, right? I mean, if you have a more, a more rigid set of criteria, you often end up looking for things to confirm that. And I, this felt in the ethnography, which I thought was quite skillful, it felt like you had sort of arrived at this framework through the field work over a long period of time, which I think is, is one of the strengths of ethnography. So I, I really did like um, the, I, the, the way you analyzed how an anywhere becomes an elsewhere and how you had this third, um, this third participant in identity construction uh, for the immigrants that you're working with. Uh, and I really thought the ethnography, it was really easy reading. It was quite seamless how you wove yourself into the scenes without making yourself the object, uh, the, the point of the scene. You wove yourself appropriately into the scenes and you also let your informants speak. So I really did enjoy the whole thing um, quite a bit. So um, so that's the repetitious part of like, it's a great book and it, no one ever gets, it's like when someone says your kid is a good kid, no parent ever gets tired of hearing somebody say that, right? So, um, so anyway, I, it's a good book and I really did enjoy it. Um, so um, I have several specific types of questions that I th think will be important to um, to look at, and I realize in Zoom, me looking at my notes is way more, I didn't teach last semester, so this is like my fourth time on Zoom. So I'm not as polished as David and Peggy are. They're like Zoom professionals. You can put them on like a talk show. I'm kind of like, I still got notes here written on paper, but, but they're sincere and I hope they'll be useful. So um, one of the questions that I had had to do with how we can use this framework as a kind of retrospective and how we can, and I'll bundle two things together. Maybe actually I'll put all three of them out there briefly and then walk through them. One of them is how we can use them to interpret prior cases, right? And I, I think, um, and I mean like the Irish and Irish Catholicism across the length of the long Irish diaspora. When was it a big deal that they were Irish in the, in the United States and when wasn't it? Because sometimes it was a big deal and was the driver, right? No Irish need apply, the no nothings, all that stuff. And then like when I was a kid, the nuns in Catholic school used to, rec they used to ask for money for the IRA in Northern Ireland, right? So, and it wasn't a terrorist organization. It, they, they were people fighting for Catholicism. So that's a pretty big distance, right? How does that happen? Um, so the second thing then is, I really, I thought your analysis of the identity construction was, was useful and good. Um, I also think that the framework and the field work you've done could be used to be analyzing processes beyond identity construction. I think there, and, and this is not a critique. Uh, I mean, I guess it is a critique, but it's not a criticism, right? It's sort of an invitation to think through how to develop your research project in the future. Um, identity is super important, but I actually saw a lot of sort of your analysis of how organizations act or don't act or how immigrants become you know quietly apolitical and removed from that or how they signal that they're good muslims how does it lead to individual action and then collective action um and and i think how something becomes an anywhere to an elsewhere and how and why individuals and organizations choose to act or not act and in what ways i think 
moving ethnographic work to not just identity construction and the analysis of it, but the analysis of action and theories of action about how organizations and how people end up moving and engaging, I think is an important thing. Um, and then the third thing, and I'll circle back through these again, um, or perhaps, yeah, the third thing, is, and the third and fourth thing, um, I, part of this is gonna echo very strongly what David said, but I think I have, a, it's a slightly different way. I really thought that the, the, the metaphor of exogenous shock was useful, and I thought you used it really well. But I also thought, and I have a thing about metaphors, right, that and my students really get annoyed with me, but I'm quite pedantic about it in the good and bad sense of that. Um, exogenous to what? Right, and so because the, in, so you're sort of falling back into like an assimilationist framework of the here and the there, or even a transnational framework. I kind of agree with Peggy. You're you're short selling the transnationalist literature a little bit, but every framing, no framing is perfect. And I think Peggy and David and I would all say, you know, we we framed it the best way we could, and other people who we said their work didn't do certain things got annoyed with it, and it's fine. But exogenous to what? And I think if you were to answer more of that question um, in subsequent work, not in this book, this is a great book, um, it would have to do, it would bring in the larger global processes that are creating the conditions under which things go from being an anywhere to an elsewhere. So for example, research on how state, because state diaspora relationships don't always turn into strong diasporas. Sometimes they're just on paper, sometimes they're vigorous. Well, there are frameworks you might use to adopt that would work on this. And one of the key things is, the countries, the sending countries position in the global system, is it, and, and how they relate to the hegemon, right? And this is how you, this is a framework you might use, for example, to distinguish between why um, Jews who lobby Congress and Israel lobbying, lobbying Congress has been so effective despite the small numbers of, relative numbers of Jews in the population versus, for example, Filipinos in the United States, right? And because there's a lot of Filipinos in, in the US and they're almost all citizens and there's not a, I mean, I'm sure there's a Filipino action committee, but I don't know anything about it and they're not setting diasporic policy, US policy for the diaspora. So I think one of the things um, that might help would be to sort of, might help in extending the work and also that your framework might help to elaborate would be looking back some in history at some of the cases that um, th that might you might be able to help distinguish between uh, you know why and how and anywhere becomes an elsewhere. So I, I went briefly through the Irish case before, right? Where being Irish was a disqualifying stigma, uh, and it was a very I mean it was like being an Afri it was like being an African American in many places, right? But then it stopped being that because of changes in political power, uh, the emergence of the I Irish state. Um, the emergence of, I, of Irish people into power in, you know, Irish Americans into the United States. Um, that would be an interesting case. Um, I'm thinking also of an, a, a more obscure case of one of my dissertation students, uh, Hiro Shibata. Um, you wouldn't know anything about this because he hasn't published that yet, but it may, your, your, your work made me really think of this. So um, this, Hiro's work has to do with analyzing state diaspora, one of part of it, state diaspora relation, relationship between Japanese immigrants to Brazil and the Brazilian state and society and Japanese society um, and the state. And in the 1890s through the 1930s, there was a colonizing ethic and being Japanese and part of a racially important group, being a, a superior race was a key part of driving all of their organizing and all of their thinking. Then with the defeat of Japan in the second world war, and with the simultaneous push by Brazil to, to do nation state building and make Brazilians, all of that stuff fell apart in a relatively short period of time, right? It could be an, a useful historic, not that you need to do research on it, but it could be a useful historical case for you to look at in terms of the current moment you're in, because you're in the middle of this thing where Islam has become so big in the world, right? So that might, I mean, in, in, in a subsequent sort of historical perspective. Um, so I think those are uh, some of the things that I think would be interesting. I also, um, I wonder more, 
you did a nice, I learned a lot of historical stuff. Oh, and you're looking tired. Like I'm asking you to do all this stuff now. I'm not. I'm trying to invite you as a colleague to just think through. Okay, because you really, your face was like, oh my God, but I don't mean it that way. I really did enjoy the book. I'm, I'm not just saying that, I'm, I'm quite sincere. Um, I wonder about the construction of Islam and the place of Islam in the world, in the global system now, right? So you're using it as an identity, a thing about identity, a, a factor in identity construction, but it's actually emerged as a global force in the, as a, a key force in the global system in a way that I think could be useful to you to think about in, in further pursuing your reach, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, I, I didn't know, for example, that the, um, Bangladesh was the only state formed Muslims, right? Was, or was it, um, yeah, it was Bangladesh, right? No, Pakistan. Sorry, I got them backwards. I didn't know that. I, I mean, it made sense to me. But what's interesting is the only attempt to form a new state that succeeded for a little while on a religious model is ISIS trying to create a caliphate several years ago. They created a state for a short time. It was taken back. But for a global movement to get people to leave their homelands and go do this, it's quite remarkable. I am not saying that that's what Islam is, right? But I'm saying it's one of the things that, it, that one of the reasons why Islam has become so important in the world and through the internet world, right? And I, I think that global power of Islam as a, as a central axis, as a religious way to live and organize power and the economy, is, it's a significant change in the global system that I think would be useful for you to look at. Um, I also, and this I'll, I'll stop now because Russell, I'm, I'm gonna be over my time soon, I think, right? I'm, I'm, I, I didn't check, but I think, I feel like I'm gonna be over. Um, right now. Yeah. Right now, so I'll finish up then. So the last example, so one of the things I was thinking of, and, and so look, all of these things that your book made me think of, this is great, right? But one of the things I was thinking of is, um, you know, there are fundamentalist Christians. Like, I, I, Islam, part of the reason I think that Islam is different in the world system than other religions now is that you don't have other religions that have states organized around them. Right? We, we had like a Holy Roman Empire a gazillion years ago that was organized around that. All the other states, like with the Mexicans that I study or David studies, or I think the Dominicans Peggy studied in her first book, being Catholic or religious in their home country and their host country didn't make any difference. It didn't, there was no conflict, right? Um, so, but I, and I think then this other model is out there. And so I think the reaction to being good Muslims and stuff like that is a, is a rejection of that other vision of also the global system, not just of being a Muslim. And I think that's a, a point you could further develop. But I also think like, for example, there are a lot of fundamentalist Christians, for example, and in very powerful places, the people who support Israel making Jerusalem, its capital, are doing so because they want to promote an apocalypse. They think this will bring us closer to the end of days, right? Now, that sounds like, in my New York Times knowledge, right? That sounds like a crazy notion. But in fact, these are powerful people who are making public policy based on a notion of, of, of a theocratic state, um, you know, a Christian theocratic state. They haven't done that, but the, it's, a, it's another current in the world of religion being a central axis for the distribution and use of power, resources, etc. And I think this, these larger global changes would be things that in your success work in, a, in, in, in the wake of your very successful first book might be things to think about. Anyway, thank you, Russell. I think I went over, but I, I tried not to do it too much. But congratulations again. I really did enjoy the book, and I, I really did learn things from it. And, and, uh, and it was a pleasure to read and to comment on. Um, so, so thank you um, all for your comments, and there's a lot of food for thought here. Uh, so I want to give uh, Tassin some time to uh, respond to them and to engage them. Thank you, um, David, Peggy, Rob for what seems like a blueprint for several other books that I can pursue in the future. <laughs> um, Russell, how, how much time do I have? Just, uh, just so I know how to address the comments. Um, right now, we're still um, waiting for questions. So I would actually encourage 
the audience to use that Q&A button at the bottom of their screen, I believe, to uh, write uh, questions down. I think it's harder when they have to write their questions down versus just ask them right verbally. So just, um, yeah, engage some of the points. There's a lot of questions I think you already post. Um, that was already posted to you by the panelists. Okay, all right, thank you. Oh, uh, wow, where do I start? Like so many provoking questions. Um, let me see if I can puzzle through at least some of them uh, here in our conversation. So I think that uh, a common pattern that I saw in, in all the six questions, uh, sorry, all the nine questions, three, uh, yeah, the, the three, all of you asked uh, three questions each that I saw is really the globalized space, be it uh, a religious transnational space or a form of self-identification or identification by others, anywheres becoming elsewheres. So this is exactly the kind of globalized interconnected uh, interconnectedness that I wanted the multi-centered relational framework to capture. And one example that I gave in my book that I would like to uh, that, that I would like to describe here and then use that as an example to address all the questions is the example of Nigeria. So in my book, I give the example of Nigeria and how 50% of Nigeria's population is Muslim, but my participants neither knew nor cared about Nigeria. They didn't know where Nigeria was on the world map. They didn't know its demographic profile. They didn't know its shape. Um, but what they, it was basically irrelevant in their day-to-day -day lives. But Nigeria became relevant because of Boko Haram and its connections to ISIS. Uh, and even though Boko Haram was um, active since 2002, it was only in 2014 that the US public and the global public became aware of Boko Haram uh, because Michelle Obama had publicized a campaign to bring back 300 Nigerian schoolgirls that Boko Haram had kidnapped. She did not launch the campaign. It was launched by the education minister in Nigeria, but she publicized it uh, using Twitter. Now, according to my participants, Boko Haram gave Muslims a bad name. Even though they had very vague idea about Nigeria, they knew that Boko Haram was in Nigeria and what they did in Nigeria affected them here in America. So this, this example I used to show how an irrelevant case becomes relevant um, to the immigrants when context place draws the host lands, media, and political in a way that made their um, stigmatized Muslim identities even more suspect, even more vulnerable. So to address uh, David's comments first about exogenous shock, call this an exogenous shock because it is something that emanated an event from outside of the territory of the hostland and the homeland. That does not mean that exogenous shocks, I'll get to the shock part later, happens in a vacuum. Um, exogenous uh, shocks could be argued to be the outcome of long-term historical processes between homeland, hostland, and um, uh, places beyond. But it is through these events, so exo the, part, the conceptual purpose of the exo of exogenous shocks to, is to capture how these places that immigrants had very vague ideas about become relevant to their everyday life, how they self-identify, how they are identified by others. So uh, ISIS and Boko Haram, the, their genesis arguably goes back a long time before before the war on terror. Uh, uh, some could argue that it is a result of Western interventions in Muslim majority countries. But when that event of 300 Nigerian schoolgirls being kidnapped and the mainstream newspapers and social media, uh, uh, the, okay, see the chat, but the mainstream, um, media uh, paid attention to that event and 
Michelle Obama, member of that political elite, publicized that event, it made that seemingly far away foreign context relevant to the context of the US. That, so that event, which I call here, um, highlighted the historical long time connections that existed with that elsewhere place that is neither the homeland nor the uh, nor uh, the host land so i use this example to show that to uh, to argue that you could argue that yes exogenous shocks are actually endogenous because it is because those events were relevant to what was going on in the host land that it that that uh, it drew the attention of the host lands media and political attention but i call it exogenous simply because it is happening outside of the territory of uh, the host land. With the participants, they didn't identify, they didn't self-identify with Nigeria. They didn't self-identify with uh, Boko Haram or ISIS or whatever activities that they were doing, but they felt that they would be identified by others because of this event, because it gave them a bad name. So, to your uh, comment about the conditions, is it really necessary that one would have to self-identify and be identified by others? I don't think so. It could be either or, sometimes both. So for this example, the participants didn't identify with the Bangladeshi compatriots that were in Nigeria. Yeah, they didn't have a with that faraway place, but they felt that they could be identified by others because of the perceived association based on the, their, their uh, religious identity category. Um, as for the shock, uh, I, I have to agree with you that is it really, um, is it really too limited? I have to think about that, but I would go back to uh, the point that the shocks are important because these are the moments, those events are the moments when the tension between the homeland, hostland, and elsewhere peaks. Those are the moments that highlight those pre-existing, previously latent connections at the global level that make different places, different regions of the world relevant to the immigrants' sense of selves on day-to-day -day life. So by using, um, the idea, the concept of shock, I try to capture those moments, but that does not mean that it is just the shocks, because I think shocks are just the tips of the tip of the iceberg. They are results of long-term historical, historical processes. Um, I think this example also shows how my participants, and this is uh, to your point, uh, Peggy, about whether my participants are in a transnational religious space, whether they are uh, members of a, of a global uh, citizenship that's based on uh, religion. In this example, I think, uh, based on this example, I would say that they are, even if they are not aware of it. They are perceived as global citizens of this transnational religious space where nationality doesn't seem to matter. That is why they, they feel that they are perceived in light of this, this event. But at the same time, in other contexts, I think that my participants were aware, they did identify of this umatic space where nationality doesn't matter. Um, but I think that, so one instance where I did uh, see that nationality didn't seem to matter is the Syrian refugee, the response to the Syrian refugee crisis in contrast to the response to the Rohingya refugee crisis. Both crises were ongoing at the same time, but my participants were more engaged with the Syrian refugee crisis and they, many of them used the, the umatic, um, I don't want to use the word justification, but the, those umatic feelings that we are all connected in this, in this space because it's, uh, because it's a Muslim related issue. But they did, they did not feel the same kind of omatic affinity with Rohingya refugees, even though they were Muslims. They were persecuted because they were Muslims. But they did not feel with uh, 
uh, with the, their, their co-religionists. So this is where I think that global transnational citizenship, where nationality does matter in the sense that these participants were, Bangladesh, were Bangladeshi, Indian, and Pakistani living in the United States a place where the Middle East was far more relevant to what was happening in their homelands. They, it was uh, more important for their day-to-day -day experience in the hostland that they pay attention to what other people can pay attention to rather than what's going on back in the homeland. So I think that this is, yes, they are global citizens in a, trans, a transnational religious space, but there is a, there is a limit to that. Um, we have uh, oh, two me... questions from uh, the audience that I'd oh. like to be able to, um, for you to engage. So if you could do that I too. I promise Rob that I'm going to uh, email him my answers to okay. his questions. Okay, so, so uh, first we have uh, two questions from Marta Bivan Ardal, and I I'll read the questions from the two um audience members. So uh, she says, thanks for an amazing book and super interesting comments as well. Um, so she has two questions. And the first, um, I'll probably just focus on the first, which is how might uh, the roles potentially of elsewheres change for immigrants and their descendants? Um, might descendants relate more to elsewheres, um, for example, as part of the UMA, if um, or as ties to ancestral homelands might weaken? Or how might this play out? In, in the second uh, generation. So because there's another question and we really have four more minutes, I'll just go to the second question of another audience member, uh, Pallavi Banerjee, who asks, would you uh, say social media has made exogenous shocks, uh, I guess more shocking. So would um, what role does uh, the social media play? So would um, the way exogenous shocks be felt differently have different impacts in pre-social media Era. Okay, both of them are so great. I'll try my best to answer them really fast. So the first question, whether elsewhere, an excellent question, is elsewhere a first generation phenomenon or does it really carry over to the second generation, to the children of immigrants? My argument is yes, as I show in my book, that elsewhere affects both first and second generation immigrants, but differently. The, for the first generation immigrants, their primary ties seem to be with, unsurprisingly, with the homeland but they are still affected by elsewhere contexts because they also reside in the United States where they are perceived in a different light because of their ethnicity, because of their religion. Uh, for the second generation, because they are in the US, they are, they are affected by a geopolitical context that pulls, associates them to different uh, elsewhere contexts, but they respond to different elsewhere contexts differently. For instance, the first generation uh, Muslim immigrants are often hesitant to really associate themselves publicly at least with Middle Eastern uh, contexts because they feel that that would draw more suspicion to their religious identities. The second generation, they are more Americanized. They identify as being American. By being global, they're being more American. By speaking out about global issues, they feel that they are part of the multicultural milieu, and they are more vocal about uh, certain um, elsewhere contexts that their parents are more hesitant about. The second question about social media, uh, how relevant it is. I think it's very important as a, as a component of the filter system that filters those global geopolitical contexts in digestible pieces that make relevant certain contexts in everyday life for not just the immigrants, but also the people around them. So does social media uh, exogenous shocks more shocking? I, I don't have an answer to that immediately, but do they make a certain um, else, elsewhere contexts events more relevant? Absolutely, because not many people read the New York Times, everyone is on Facebook and Twitter. I, uh, I, I hope I was, able to uh, address both Yeah, questions. so this is actually um, a, a perfect uh, end to this fantastic uh, hour we spent together.